Good afternoon and welcome. It is March the 8th. It's Wednesday, time for a check-in, sharing some news, some updates, and a song, a poem, and a prayer. It's been a few weeks since I've been able to be with you because of scheduling conflicts, so good to be back once again. A reminder that our services include both in-person and online offerings. Sunday mornings, you can join us at 9.30 a.m. for Eucharist. That service gathers around the font and includes our Sunday school programming. At 11 o'clock, a more traditional Anglican service with choir and organ. And at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoons, Evensong or a concert event is, is held as part of our Sundays at 4 series. You can get the full schedule of the 4 o'clock events on our cathedral website. We also remind you that on Wednesday mornings, we hold a Eucharist at 7.30 in the morning here in the cathedral. And on Fridays at noon, a Book of Common Prayer communion service. And as well, Wednesday afternoons at noon, here in the cathedral chapel, we host an in-person meditation group. And an online meditation group meets on Thursday evenings at 6.30. That particular group, in order to get the email confirmation and Zoom link, you are asked to email prayasyoucan3, that's the number three, at gmail.com. This coming Sunday, March the 12th, will be the Sunday that we turn our clocks forward. So we spring forward, which also means you lose an hour's sleep. So just keep that in mind if you're coming to church on Sunday. We also want to share with you that the date for the annual meeting of our cathedral congregation will be Sunday, March the 26th. That event will be held in the Great Hall following our 11 o'clock service. Also want to pass on to you the news that Mildred Lewis, a longtime member of this cathedral family and one of our greeters who would welcome people at the door, passed away last week. Her service will be held on March the 16th at one o'clock here in the cathedral. Within our diocese, a reminder of the Vital Church Maritimes Conference that is coming up. This year's theme is Setting Sail discerning next steps for future flourishing missional ministry. Keynote speaker will be the Reverend Dr. Don Davis, who once served here at our cathedral. And another guest at that conference will be Mr. Stephen Doucette Campbell, a registered psychotherapist. He will lead sessions on leadership, mental health, and resilience. This conference is open to anyone, lay or clergy. It features relevant and inspiring presentations, lots of discussion and sharing time, creative worship, prayer, and more. Registration includes materials and most of the meals. Funding support is available, and again, it is open to clergy and lay people, so if you are interested or know someone in your parish that might be interested, please have them check out the registration on the Diocese of Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island website. The Anglican Church Women Diocesan Board, in partnership with the Mothers' Union Diocesan Council, will co-host Wednesday, March the 15th, from 7 to 8.15 p.m., a virtual Lenten program, Reflections 2023, with postulants in our diocese offering reflections on the synod's theme of we shall all be changed. A short opening worship will be led by Bishop Sue. All are welcome. If you would like to attend that, please RSVP your intentions by email to acw.nsboard at gmail.com. Today is the International Women's Day, a global holiday celebrated annually on March the 8th. The earliest reported Women's Day observance was called National Women's Day, and it was held on February 28, 1909 in New York City, organized by the Socialist Party of America at the suggestion of activist Teresa Malkai. She was born in Bar, the Russian Empire, now the Ukraine, on May 1, 1874, 
one of seven sisters. She and her family were Jewish and immigrated to the United States, settling in Lower East Side, New York City in 1891. 17-year-old Teresa went to work as a cloak maker in a local garment factory. She was the first woman to rise from factory worker to leadership in the Socialist Party. Her published novel in 1910, The Diary of a Shirtwaist Striker, is credited with helping to reform New York state labor laws. As head of the Women's National Committee of the Socialist Party of America, she established an annual National Women's Day, which was the precursor to the International Women's Day. She spent her later years promoting adult education for women and workers. In August of 1910, an international socialist women's conference was organized ahead of the general meeting of the Socialist Second International in Copenhagen, Denmark. However, what made history for the modern celebration of International Women's Day was a fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City on March the 25th of 1911. That tragedy killed 146 young workers, most of whom were immigrants. The following year, the first International Women's Day was marked by over a million people in Austria, Denmark, Germany, and Switzerland. In 1914, International Women's Day was held on March the 8th for the first time in Germany, and possibly that date was chosen because it was a Sunday and holiday. As elsewhere, Germany's observance was dedicated to the women's right to vote. Concurrently, there was a march in London in support of women's suffrage, during which Sylvia Pankhurst, a prominent English socialist and feminist, was arrested in front of Charing Cross Station on her way to speak at Trafalgar Square. On March the 8th, 1917, in Petrograd, Russia, now St. Petersburg, women textile workers began a demonstration that eventually engulfed the whole city, demanding bread and peace, an end to World War I, to food shortages, and to czarism. The International Women's Day remained predominantly a communist holiday until roughly 1967, when it was taken up by a second wave of feminists. The day reemerged as a day of activism and is sometimes known in Europe as the Women's International Day of Struggle. The United Nations began celebrating International Women's Day in 1975, which had been proclaimed the International Year of Women. In 1977, the United Nations General Assembly invited member states to proclaim March the 8th as an official UN holiday for women's rights and world peace. It has since been commemorated annually by the UN and much of the world, with each year's observance centered on a particular theme or issue within women's rights. This year's theme is Embrace Equality. So with that as a background for today, a poem, there is perhaps none more expressive and powerful than the great Maya Angelou's Phenomenal Woman. I've shared that one in years past, and I do encourage you to look that one up. So today, instead, I draw your attention to a lesser-known poet by the name of Liesel Mueller. Liesel was a German-born American poet, translator, and academic teacher. Her father, Fritz Newman, was a high school teacher and a progressive educator who delivered a speech in 1933 to an assembly of teachers in Hamburg, Germany, warning of the dangers of the Nazi ideology. And when the Nazis came to power, he was dismissed from his position, interrogated by the Gestapo for four days, and then when released, fled to Italy, then to the United States, where he was accepted in 1937 as a political refugee. He eventually became a professor of French and German at Evansville College in Chicago. Liesel followed at the age of 15 with her mother and younger sister, arriving in the United States on the 9th of June, 1939. She would eventually graduate from the University of Evansville and then began to write poetry, publishing her first collection titled Dependencies in 1965. She worked as a literary critic and taught at the University of Chicago 
Elmhurst College and Goddard College. She received numerous awards, including the National Book Award in 1981 and the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1997, the only German-born poet awarded that prize. Mueller currently resides in a retirement community outside of Chicago. So here is her poem titled, The Laughter of Women. The laughter of women sets fire to the halls of injustice and the false evidence burns to a beautiful white lightness. It rattles the chambers of Congress and forces the windows wide open so the, so the fatuous speeches can fly out. The laughter of women wipes the mist from the spectacles of the old. It infects them with a happy flu, and they laugh as if they were young again. Prisoners held in underground cells imagine that they see daylight when they remember the laughter of women. It runs across water that divides and reconciles two unfriendly shores like flares that signal the news to each other. What a language it is, the laughter of women, high-flying and subversive. Long before law and scripture, we heard the laughter. We understood the freedom. That's the poem, The Laughter of Women, by Lizelle Mueller. For a song, here is one that stretches way back to 1963. A hit song for the artist known as Leslie Gore called you Don't Own Me. Remarkable lyrics for the time, which in part read, don't tell me what to do, don't tell me what to say, and please, when I go out with you, don't put me on display, cause you don't own me. Don't try to change me in any way, you don't own me. Don't tie me down, cause I'm never gonna stay. Leslie Gore was born Leslie Sue Goldstein, May the 2nd, 1946, in Brooklyn, New York City, into a middle-class Jewish family, the daughter of Leo Goldstein and Ronnie Gore. Her father was the owner of Peter Pan, a children's swimwear manufacturer. She was raised in, Tep in New Jersey and attended the Dwight School for Girls in nearby Englewood. She also attended Sarah Lawrence, College, Sarah Lawrence College. At the age of 16, she recorded the pop hit, It's My Party, which became a US number one hit in 1963. She followed that up with 10 further Billboard Top 40 hits, including Judy's Turn to Cry and the song I mentioned, You Don't Own Me. The song is described on the Wikipedia article as a soft but stoic anthem of female empowerment. Reacting to the song's overwhelming popularity, Gore herself said it was not as much a female empowerment song as much as it was a song about empowerment for all, celebrating the moment when you realize that your story is yours alone and no one else's. I would also point you to a song by the modern singer-songwriter Alicia Beth Moore Hart. And if that name doesn't ring a bell, you may know her by her stage name of Pink. Born September 8, 1979 in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, her mother, Judith Kugel, was an emergency room nurse. Her father, James Moore, was an insurance salesman. Her Wikipedia article notes she described herself as an Irish, German, Lithuanian Jew and identifies as Jewish. Although a healthy baby at birth, she developed asthma that plagued her throughout her early years. Her parents divorced when she was 10 and she was raised by her mother. As a teenager, she wrote lyrics as an outlet for her feelings and her mother commented, quote, her initial writings were always very introspective some of it very black and very deep, almost worrisome, unquote. Pink began performing in Philadelphia clubs when she was about 14 years old. She adopted the stage name of Pink around that time, but the details are not clear as to why that nickname. Pink has been credited for breaking boundaries and pushing the envelope throughout her career. 
She is regarded as the, quote, most trailblazing artist of the pop generation. James Montgomery of MTV describes her as, quote, a fabulously fearless pop artist who can outsing almost anyone out there, unquote. Pink's work has inspired other artists, including the likes of Christina Aguilera, Demi Lovato, Kelly Clarkson, Katy Perry, Tegan and Sarah, Ashley Tisdale, and Adele. From her album, I'm Not Dead, released in 2006, her song, Dear Mr. President, is a wide sweeping commentary offered as a musical letter to then President George W. Bush, commenting on the state of the world and in particular, the questionable leadership of his presidency. The opening lines begin, Dear Mr. President, come take a walk with me. Let's pretend we're just two people and you're no better than me. I'd like to ask you some questions, if we can speak honestly. So do check out that song by Pink, Dear Mr. President. And as we end in prayer, here is one set aside for this International Women's Day. As we celebrate and give thanks for the achievement of women, we remember the women who have played a part in our lives, those who have nurtured us, taught us, inspired us, and loved us. Forgive us when we have limited women through inequality, by stereotype, by exclusion, through lack of opportunity. On this International Women's Day, as we acknowledge the challenges women still face, we pray that all women may know equality of health care, of education, of wealth, of prospects. We pray that all women may know themselves to be respected, safe, included, and empowered. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, in whom there is neither male nor female. Amen. Thank you for tuning in, and may God bless the rest of the week to come for you. Until we meet again.